So good afternoon, everyone. I'm very ha happy to welcome our today's speaker, Professor Gil Spazier from uh, te uh, Texas AM University and Sorbonne University. And he will be talking on seemingly injective Feynman algebras. Uh, before uh, starting with the talk, I would like to request you all to keep your audio on mute. There will be question answer session at the end. Nevertheless, if you have any questions, please do it over the chat box and wait for a signal from our coordinator, Professor Isan Patri, before unmuting your audio. So uh, welcome, uh, Professor Pizzi. Uh, we can start. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back to India. <laughs> it's been a long time uh, that I've been uh, away in some sense, and uh, I can be virtually back at least. This is a good feeling. So thank you for coming. I will uh, speak about uh, a subject uh, that is uh, closely related to injective for Neumann algebra. So I've changed screen, right? This changed page. This is this is correct. This yeah, is yeah yeah. So uh, two parts. Uh, I, I think I should start by reviewing, you know, in, in the subject of injective for Neumann algebras and many results that are. Uh, perhaps, you know, well known on this subject so that I can sort of put in perspective the, the new points that uh, I've been observing recently on what I call seemingly injective for Neumann algebras. So uh, just a quick review, of course, uh, you, you, you recall that a C-star algebra is a, uh, can be realized as a norm closed self-adjoint subalgebra of B of H, bounded operators on the Hilbert space H. When it is isometric to a dual space, then it can be realized as a weak star closed uh, self-adjoint subalgebra of B of H. So B of H is a dual, B of H is the dual of the trace class. And so it has a, a weak star topology. So B of H is of course the fundamental for Neumann algebra in some sense that contains any for Neumann algebra or any C-star algebra. Okay, now for any C-star algebra, I recall that the bidual can be, so the bidual becomes, of course, it's a dual space and it can be turned into a for Neumann algebra in a canonical way so that the, the canonical embedding of the, the, the space A into its bidual, which I, which I denote by IA like this, this canonical embedding becomes compatible with the star algebra structure. So it's a star homomorphism, isometric star homomorphism. It has a, the universal property that for any uh, representation pi with values in a, a, an arbitrary for Neumann algebra M, uh, there is a, a unique normal star homomorphism on the bidual with values in M that extends uh, the original one. So that's the, the the canonical extension property of the, the bidual. I also remind you that normal means uh, that the, the map is the, for a map between dual spaces in operator algebra theory, it's traditional to say it's normal when it is the adjoint of a map uh, you know, on the pre-dual, when it is the adjoint of a map, which is the same as saying that it is weak star to weak star continuous, right? So that you can say that it has a, a pre-adjoint. The normal means it has a pre-adjoint. So injective von Neumann algebras here quickly, I recalled also that you could define the von Neumann algebra in B of H as uh, the unital case as equal to its bicommutant. That's also the, the other classical definition. And then M, von Neumann algebra M is called injective if there is a uh, a contractive linear projection from B of H into uh, B of H onto M, okay? When M is realized as a subalgebra in B of H. This is, is, will be important in a, sequen, in, a, in, in a second. So of course, the fundamental example is B of H itself. B of H is injective, then the projection will be the identity. And uh, a famous result of Tomiyama goes back to 1970 says that automatically uh, such a contractive projection is going to be completely positive and a conditional expectation in the sense that it satisfies this uh, you know, modular property with respect to left and right multiplications by elements of M when you have a projection onto M. 
So it is this identity of conditional expectation that's automatically satisfied, very famous theorem. And in addition, the, the projection that's just contractive becomes in fact completely positive. And I've recalled at the last line that, uh, uh, as you, of course you, you all know, a map is called completely positive. If it is positive, now positive means positivity preserving, preserving positivity, but completely, completely means that this remains true, this positive uh, preservation remains true at the level of matrix algebras of arbitrary size. So the linear maps extended to matrices over A to matrices over B is positive for any size of the matrix. This is a definition of completely positive. We'll also need completely bounded. So completely bounded is a map such that all the maps UN are uniformly bounded. That's another classical definition. Completely isometric, I don't think I will need, is the case where all the maps UN are isometric for any N. So the, the link with uh, amenable groups is, uh, uh, gives us a, a good set of examples of injective phenomenon algebras, because if we consider the phenomenon algebra of a discrete group G, so that this is defined as the phenomenon algebra generated by the, the left regular representation on G. So lambda G is my notation for the left regular unitary representation on G, which acts by left translation on L2 of G. So the phenomenon algebra, uh, which can also be described as the, the weak star closure of the linear span of the range of that representation lambda G. So this phenomenon algebra of G is injective if and only if the group G is amenable. Okay, it has a, an invariant mean. So that's uh, Efros Lance, I think. Uh, I don't think that was really uh, settled before. By the way, my references to Efros Lance is 77, but this is a paper, it's a bit surprising in the order of references. It's a paper that took a long time to appear. It's in Advances in Math. It took three years to appear. And the, the paper was known in 74. It has some, some importance, you'll see later. So, as as a corollary, uh, if uh, G is a free group with uh, more than one generators, then this is well known that this is not amenable. That's in some sense the prototype of a non-amenable group. So the phenomenon algebra of G is not injective. So you will not have this contractive projection from B of H, or from here B of L2 to uh, M of G. This is the, 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 the main counterexample in some sense, okay? Okay, there's another important link for my topic today, which is the link to the approximation property. So I, I remind you that the metric approximation property of Grothendieck for Banach spaces is just the property that there is a, a net of finite rank maps, finite rank maps UI on a Banach space X, uh, which are contractions of norm less or equal to one. So that reflects, that, that, that refers to metric and, and which approximate the identity pointwise in the norm topology. So we have UI X tends to X in norm for any X in, in X. A bounded approximation property, which I, I will actually not really need, I think, uh, is the same where the maps UI are not assumed contractions, but just uniformly bounded. Now for phenomenon algebras, we will need the weak star version of this. So the weak star metric approximation property, <coughs> excuse me, is the property that we have a net of finite rank. So it's always approximation by finite rank, normal finite rank maps, contractive, which refers to metric, but now the approximation, a pointwise approximation of the identity is in the weak star sense. So UIX tends to X, weak star in the weak star topology of these dual spaces. And then uh, further on, I will need actually the positive version of this last property. So uh, for Diamond algebra has the weak star positive metric approximation property if we have again the same net, but now positive finite rank normal maps, which tend, you know, weak star to the identity. So that's the positive 
weak star positive metric approximation property. And of course, it's natural to continue with completely positive. So if a Neumann algebra has the weak star completely positive approximation property, I, I, I've left the M here. It's a little bit redundant, but I, I left the M. So for me, that's the weak star CPMAP, just to, 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 to make the analogy clear. That's when we just uh, ask for the, the finite rank maps to be completely positive and converge weak star to the identity. So uh, one of the uh, very beautiful results of Kohn's fundamental paper on injective von Neumann algebra, that's a you know, very classical 1976 Annals of Math paper uh, that uh, concerned factors, the, this fundamental result was extended by Choi Efros very, very closely afterward. And so the, the, the conclusion uh, of the Choi Efros, Kohn Choi Efros work say, is that M is injective if and only if it has the weak star CP MAP, what we just considered. And then the, the terminology is a little bit mixed in references. So uh, Efros Lance, who, who actually, you know, appeared before this paper, they, they, it was published 77, but it was circulating in 74. So they had some of these, they had partial results and they called this weak star CPMAP semi-discrete. Okay, so this weak star CPMAP is the same as injective, but that's a quite non-trivial fact actually. Now uh, I come to uh, another feature of this paper in 1976, which is definitely not emphasized by Alain Cohn, which is a problem that he raised that became, you know, gradually very famous and now very, very, it's considered the most important open problem in operator algebra theory. And uh, I'll, say, I'll say something about very recent events and it's possible that it is solved now, but I'll come back to that. Give me, give me a few minutes. So in his 76 paper, what happened is that Cohen observed that because free groups are residually finite, you know, residually finite, so that you know you have uh, uh, you know many uh, uh, represent finite dimension, sufficiently many finite dimensional representations to approximate in some sense the, the group, uh, the the von Neumann algebra of of a free group uh, embeds in an ultra product in the von Neumann sense. And this, I, I won't go into details because I'll take another route. You'll see, I'll avoid defining ultra products. But it, he showed that uh, the, this von Neumann algebra of the free group embeds in an ultra product of matrix algebras, of ultra products of finite dimensional von Neumann algebra. So it's a, it's a, a certain weak form of approximation property by finite dimensional matrix algebras, but which is definitely weaker than injectivity, you know, and the previous property that we described, because that property characterizes injective and free groups give non-injective for Neumann algebras. So it's convenient to now say that's what people say. People, I've seen people use that term. It's convenient and it's short, con embeddable. So let's say that uh, a von Neumann algebra is con embeddable if it satisfies uh, this property that it embeds in an ultra products of matrix algebras. But ultra products of matrix algebras are finite von Neumann algebras. So that would force me into uh, discussing finite, semi finite, etc. I want to avoid this. So let me, let me choose a, a, a shortcut which is convenient and so you know just very everything is correct and it, it gives me a definition for general von Neumann algebra. So I'm just cheating a little bit with the history but mathematically that uh, that should be completely okay. So I will say that the von Neumann algebra is con embeddable okay by jumping a little bit you know over certain references that I'll describe in a second unembeddable if there is an embedding of this von Neumann algebra as a von Neumann subalgebra, of course, in the bidule of B of H. And we have seen that the bidule of B of H as the bidule of any C star algebra is a von Neumann algebra. So we assume we have an embedding of M in the bidule of B of H together with a contractive projection onto M. And this, contra I, I, this contractive projection will be completely positive 
because as I've recalled, Tomiyama's theorem says this is automatic. So automatically we'll have a completely positive, contractive, and in fact, unital, if we like, projection. Okay, and this is actually uh, in the finite case, it can be shown that this is this boils down to the same property that Cohen was looking at uh, with ultra products, but this takes a little work to show that all this is the same in the finite case and so on. But I, I use this as a definition and uh, that, will be, that will be very nice for where we want to go. So uh, Kirchberg in 1993 published a fantastic paper in Inventiones where he you know, went back to several of the results of Alain Cohn. And in particular, he, he showed that, uh, he showed that uh, the, the Cohn problem is equivalent to, so now I call it the Cohn-Kirchberg problem, is equivalent to the question whether uh, any for Neumann algebra is con embeddable in this sense. So we forget about, you know, finite for Neumann algebra as factors as that was Kohn was, was looking at. Now it's a question about any for Neumann algebra. Is any for Neumann algebra con embeddable in the sense which is here? So this was realized by, by Kirchberg in, uh, in, his, in his paper. And he, he realized a little bit more. He has a, a, a number of equivalent forms of the, the Kohn problem. So that also explains why I call it the Kohn-Kirchberg problem. He really renewed, renewed the, the question. And one of his uh, equivalent forms of the problem uh, is involves the, the weak expectation property, which is a property that Lance introduced in his very famous paper in 1973 on uh, nuclear uh, C-star algebras. So Lance uh, defined a, a C-star algebra to be, to have the weak expectation property and I will uh, abbreviate that by WEP. So a C-star algebra, I will say loosely is WEP or has the WEP, but it's quicker to say is WEP. If there exists a, a mapping T, which is what is called, this is what we call a weak expectation. So instead of asking for these projections as we did until now, we ask just for an operator from B of H to the bidule of A. It's not gonna be a projection, but it has the property that this diagram here commutes. So this operator from B of H to the bidule, when restricted to A gives you uh, recovers for you the inclusion map from A into the bidule. And you ask, of course, this map to be a, a, a completely positive contraction. And actually it is like in Tomiyama, if it is a contraction, it, it will be, there will be automatically one which is completely positive. So let's say completely positive contraction. That's the WEP. It can be shown that this is uh, the same as uh, doing uh, what is written here in the last lines. That is, it is the same as asking that when you look at the embedding of the bidule of A in the bidule of B of H, do you look at this embedding which is obtained by by transposition? So not any embedding. This is the embedding precisely obtained by by transposition of the embedding of A in B of H as a C star subalgebra. Then you ask for simply, again, a contractive projection from P to, uh, from, from B of, by dual of B of H to by dual of A. I've, I've put here a warning because this is a, a, a sort of a subtlety in this subject. You see, I will try now to go, to go back. If I go back, oops, here. You see that we've defined con embeddable. We've defined con embeddable like this. Okay, so it looks like uh, oops, it looks like uh, we have the, the same thing now for the for the bidule. So in other words, uh, if the bidule suppose that M is the bidule, if M is the bidule, I seem to be saying the same thing as the previous definition. So the subtlety that I want to insist on by this warning is that here I'm saying there is an embedding. So it's an arbitrary embedding of M in B of H star. 
while here I'm saying not any embedding, I'm saying the embedding, in some sense, the canonical one, which is obtained by, by transposing the embedding of A in B of H, okay, any, you know, star homomorphic embedding of A in B of H. So that's a, that's a different notion. This is stronger, this is WEP. And uh, in fact, uh, the connection is that the, the previous property that we've considered is what is called QWEP. And uh, the, uh, another form of the con embedding problem proposed by, by Kirchberg says that uh, every C star algebra, so this is uh, the, another, another version of the con problem, every C star algebra should be a quotient of a WEP C star algebra of course, quotient as a C-star algebra. So these algebras, quotient of WEP, of course, are, are abbreviated to QWEP. So what Kirchberg proved to, to summarize is that the con problem and this conjecture just above here, formulated above, they are equivalent. And in fact, they are equivalent simply because uh, to say that the von Neumann algebra is, Q, is, is con embeddable, is the same as saying that it is quotient of WEP, okay? So this is where, you know, the warning that I made is important that you have to, you have to, this QWEP is weaker than WEP and it was conjectured to be universal, okay? So by the way, uh, the passage to the Baidule is, is not a problem for this property, so, a QWEP, if and only if the by dual is QWEP, which is, I say, or con embeddable, because we now know this is the same for, for a von Neumann algebra. Okay. So, uh, high time for now an adver advertisement. And my advertisement is advertisement for my book. Uh, I have been working on this book for, you know, quite uh, several years. These are courses that I was giving at Texas A&M on tensor products of C-star algebras and operator spaces. And that book, which uh, concentrates on the Kohn-Kirchberg problem, problem that I just described, appeared uh, in Cambridge in January of, of this year. And by the way, part of the advertisement is that, you know, you can download it for free if you go to archive and you go to the reference list for this book on any of my recent papers, any of my recent papers, quote this book with the URL so you can download it for free from the, from the URL. So uh, the unfortunate thing is that, you know, when I finally decided to give up and sort of, you know, end up writing the book and publish it, uh, same month of appearance of the book, January of 2020, appeared a preprint by uh, five authors who uh, claim to have a negative solution to the problem. So very unfortunate to publish a book uh, centered around a problem. And when a solution that will obviously will not be in the book for, as you will see, for many reasons, it will cannot be in the book. Uh, that's very unfortunate, but anyway, it's a fact. So the five authors are G, Natarajan, Vidic, Wright, and Yuen. And uh, the paper has a title that doesn't refer to the conjecture, but they obtain a negative solution to the Con Kirchberg problem. And in fact, uh, my book also explains that this is equivalent to a, a, a version of the problem proposed by Cyril Sud in the 1980s in quantum information theory. I, I'm reviewing in the book all the equivalent forms of the problem, and Cyrilson is one of them. So they, they use uh, quantum information theory, computer science, logics, complexity theory, a very, very complicated chain of arguments to conclude that the solution is, is negative. So this is very difficult to check for operator algebraists. I haven't heard yet uh, that any uh, person outside these of the, the fields that the authors have been able to check, um, to, to check the proofs, but you know, uh, presumably it will be done sometime, uh, hopefully sometime soon, uh, uh, before we get the vaccine, after we get the vaccine, I don't know. Okay, 
So uh, anyway, this is this is uh, on hold, and in any event, depending you know uh, whether or not this is confirmed, uh, definitely their solution doesn't uh, solve the problem about group von Neumann algebras, which has you know a lot of interest raised a lot of interest in group theory, infinite group theory. So for a group von Neumann algebra, is it true for any discrete group that it is con-embeddable or equivalently QWEP? So this is, this is anyway, they don't claim this. They just claim that the von Neumann algebra problem has a negative solution for groups. This, this is urgent to, to, to solve now since we, we have some indication that apparently the solution is negative, probably is negative for, for groups. Okay, so I pass now to the second part of the, the talk. And before I, I, I reach the seemingly injective von Neumann algebras, uh, let me uh, discuss a problem which uh, somehow I find very surprising that it is uh, still open. It struck me uh, recently and uh, I have hopefully, I thought I had an approach to solve it, I'm less, optimistic now, but what I'm presenting now is motivated really by an approach to solve this problem. So it's very, very simple. Suppose you consider a C-star algebra C and a quotient C-star algebra C over I. So of course, I is a two-sided self-adjoint closed ideal so that you have a, you know, a C-star algebra as the quotient space. Q is the quotient map. You consider a separable Banach space X, a bounded linear map U into the quotient, and you ask whether you can lift, whether you can find a bounded lifting U hat from X to C. More precisely, uh, it's actually open whether when U is a contraction, so you assume that U has norm, say, one, can you find a lifting also of norm one? So, very surprisingly, it seems that this is still open. You, you need separability somewhere. So separability on X, separability on the quotient or on C, but it's, it's, it ends up to be the same, but you need separability somewhere. It is known that the answer is positive, but only if you assume a metric approximation property for the contractive problem or bounded approximation property if you don't care to preserve contractivity. The, the very classical references for this problem are Subchik 1941, which roughly addresses the commutative case, case of commutative C-star algebra. He has this very famous theorem that if you look at C0 inside L infinity, so sequences tending to zero inside bounded sequences that they form an ideal, then the, when you look at the quotient, you cannot lift. This is the famous Subchik uh, uh, phenomenon. Some sense that's a counterexample, but that's non separable. Other results of Subchik show that the commutative case will have a positive answer uh, in the separable context. So and then there's a set uh, of. May I ask a question? Jit? What is course, the pleasure. point of the C star algebra here? C? I mean, because X is a Banach space. So C is a C star take... algebra. C is a C star algebra, yes. And yeah. C over I is the quotient C star algebra. You don't see my line number three? Yeah, 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 I see. But uh, what I'm asking is that, uh, I mean, what is the speciality about the C-star algebra here? I mean, why is the problem not stated more generally? Oh, well, uh, Banach space quotients is lots of counterexamples. And this will be clear in a, in a second when I discuss, you know, complementation, relation to complementation. But uh, so this is, this is open because the quotients of C-star algebras, as, as you will see also in the next slides, are very special. And it was considered more generally for M ideals. So, you know, the theory uh, in the early 70s, there was this uh, theory of M ideals that developed, I think, after uh, work by F. Ross, maybe Alfsen, F. Ross, and so on. And for M ideals, there are known counterexamples. So, uh, M ideals are somehow it's, it's understood, but ideals in C star algebras, this is still not known. So it's, you know, it's a, these problems are, I, I like these problems, but I have to say they are not very popular in operator algebra theory because they're, they're hybrid, they're hybrid, you know, between Banach space and operator algebras. And, you know, you're, you're, you're asking for here a bounded map, which you lift as a bounded map and you don't not, 
you're forgetting the product. So that's not so natural, you know, product or order and so on. But okay. And the classical references are Vesterstrom, Anderson, and Ando. There's a, I, I, I will come back to that. They they prove that the answer Ando proved that the answer is positive under metric approximation property on X or on the quotient or on U. You could make the assumption be on the map U that you approximate U directly by finite rank maps and then, then you can live. <coughs> and there is a connection of the lifting problem uh, with uh, the complemented ideal problem. In some sense, it's two versions of the same, same question complemented ideal problem is simply this. You can actually uh, easily reduce your lifting problem to just lifting the, the identity map of the quotient. So if, the, if the, quo, the identity map of the quotient lifts up into C, of course you can lift any, any map U. So this is, this is the critical case. Now, if you lift a quotient, as you all know, that means that you are producing a bounded projection somewhere, right? So simply, if your uh, lifting is U hat, and you look now at the, the, the lifting is U hat, so the composition of the quotient map by the lifting, that's the definition of lifting, gives you the identity of <coughs> C over I. If you compose in the other direction, U hat Q, then you get a, 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 you'll get a, a contractive projection, that's the case of U hat contractive. So if U hat is contractive, it is contractive projection. And then one minus Q, the complementary projection, will be a, a projection onto I. And it will be a projection of norm less than, of course, one plus the norm of Q by the triangle inequality. <clears throat> so in general, it will be less than two. So if U hat is of norm one, this will be of norm less than two. This is, you know, one of the things that Subchik observed that you cannot do better than, than this projection two in <clears throat> the situation of Subchik that I've described. So the, the related problem, which is almost the same problem is whether every ideal in a separable C-star algebra is complemented, meaning whether there exists a bounded linear projection from C onto the ideal. It's amazing that something so simple, so basic is still open, but you know, it is, it is still open. I don't describe it as the same problem because of this little glitch with the norm of the projection. You see that it's conceivable that, that well, it's open whether there is you know, a contractive lifting and a contractive lifting produces a projection P with norm less or equal to two, okay? But a projection of norm less or equal to two, of course, conversely, will not bring you back to a contractive lifting. So, so it's not exactly the same problem. But if you care for just bounded liftings, then bounded liftings are the same as, of course, asking whether uh, you have always a projection to the idea. OK. Now, let me go to. Uh, yeah, let, let, let me explain uh, the finite dimensional case. So what, what happens for uh, these lifting problems is that the, the finite dimensional case uh, turns out to be uh, always true. And this, is this explains why under metric approximation property, the global lifting is possible. So it's known that the local lifting always exists. By this, I mean that if we are in this situation that we want to lift a map U, as I've indicated before, if we restrict the map U to a finite dimensional subspace, so this is important, E should be finite dimensional, and we look at the restriction of the map U to this finite dimensional subspace, this restriction lifts. That is, we can find a map UE with the same norm that, that lifts the, the restriction, so such that the, the diagram which is here commutes. And so this, of course, uh, for restriction to finite dimensional spaces, when you know that you can approximate U by you know, finite rank maps, you can easily guess that it leads to, to the solution. This is what Anderson and Ando proved. 
So there is a, a close link uh, of these questions with local reflexivity. And uh, let me see. So, so let, me, let, me, let me explain this. this is, uh, I think it's very easy to, to see just on diagram. So the link with local reflexivity starts with the, the key observation that the, the bidual of, of, of your C star algebra C uh, splits very nicely as the direct sum in the L infinity sense of the bidual of the ideal and the bidual of the quotient. So you have really a direct sum of C star algebra that gives you the composition of the bidual. In other words, when you pass to the bidual, the lifting problem becomes completely obvious. That is, if you look at your now extension of your quotient extended, your quotient extended to be the bidual, you enlarge it to make it the by turn it into the by dual, then you have a lifting because you have this splitting. So you can of course lift by this row, which actually is a perfect lifting. It's going to be a star homomorphism. It lifts this up into C star. And so for your diagrams, you see that everything is okay as long as you uh, accept that you don't go into C, but you go into the by dual of C. But now in Banach space theory, there's a famous local reflexivity principle that was discovered by uh, actually Linden Strauss and, and Rosenthal. And the local reflexivity principle says that when E is finite dimensional, C any Banach space, you have an isometric identity, which is written here, which is a, a, a non-trivial fact by now very well understood, but non-trivial fact. And it says that isometrically, the norm of an operator from E to the bidual of C is the same as, as its norm in uh, the bidual of the bounded operators from E to C. So the content of the local reflexivity principle is that if, if you have a U, which is in the unit ball of the space on the left here that I'm circling, so you have a U which is in the unit ball of the bounded operators from E to C star, li like we have here in this diagram, then in fact, it is the weak star limit of a net of maps which are in the unit ball of operators from E to C, right? That's a canonical, that's a standard property of unit ball of biduals, right? So that means that in this, in this diagram up there, when you look at the restriction to a finite dimensional E, you have a map from E to the bidual but this map from E to the bidule is going to be, which is of norm one, let's say if U was of norm one, we suppose we do contractions. So this is a contraction, but it is approximable by contractions UI from E to C, but it's approximable weak star. Okay, so that seems to be not nice. It's approximable weak star. Okay, it's approximable weak star, but look at the left side of the diagram. There are no bidules there. We are with, the spaces themselves. So on the left part of the bidule, the weak star topology, weak star topology, recall what it is. So that's sigma C double star C star. It becomes the weak topology because there, there are no bidules. So this is, this is the weak topology. And now Mazur's theorem, Mazur's classical theorem says that if we, if we pass to convex combination, if we have you know, a, a net that converges for the weak topology, we pass to convex combinations, we can obtain a net that converges for the norm topology. So in other words, if we use this Mazur theorem, then can pass to, from UI to convex combinations of the UIs, we get here that this uh, approximation UI becomes uh, an approximate in norm. So in other words, the diagram, the lifting, diagram uh, becomes commute, almost commuting, but in norm. You have an error. The error that you're making is just small in norm. And of course, if it is small in norm, then you can use a perturbation argument, elementary perturbation argument to make it you know, really fit. So you get a, a, a real lifting with a priori, you'll get a lifting of norm, maybe one plus epsilon because you, you have a perturbation, so you're doing an error. Maybe the norm will be less than one plus epsilon. But then the last point is there is a very pretty uh, <coughs> result of Arveson, a principle, I call it Arveson's principle, that tell you that if you can lift you know, with 
maps of norm less than one plus epsilon for any epsilon, as, as we can hear, then actually you can lift with contractions. So that completes the, that completes the, the result. The reason that I'm detailing this case is that it applies exactly identically to the positive lifting problem. So in the positive case for positive maps, the situation is <coughs> in fact the same. So uh, if we have a, a positive map and uh, we restrict to a finite dimensional subspace, then we, finite dimensional subspace, which is say uh, now an operator system. So E will be a finite dimensional operator system in this uh, setting here. Then we can find a lifting which is positive with the same norm. And if U was unital positive, we will be able to lift with a unital positive of the, of the same norm. So the situation is entirely parallel. And uh, in fact, the existence of global positive contractive lifting is open again when we deal with X now a separable, let's say a separable operator system, okay? So that we have also a space X, which is ordered, we can make sense of positive elements of X and so on. <coughs> so uh, the analog of the, uh, the result about the approximation property is now if X is the positive matrix approximation property of each, or if U, is approximable by positive finite rank, suitable sense, then you can, you can lift. Uh, incidentally, it's useful to point out here that uh, the same holds for n positive maps. So n positive maps are maps such that u n precisely with the same n that you use in n times n matrices. Uh, so the n positive maps satisfy the same lifting problem, but you have to fix n for completely positive it is not true so that that result here that i just stated that that's the strong result is it's well known that this fails for if you replace positive by completely positive but for fix n you can put n positive Okay, and the, the reason uh, why all this works is that actually Vesterström proves, it's perhaps not so well known, uh, an analog of the local reflexivity principle in this situation when E is a finite dimensional, say, operator system, C a C star algebra. If you look at the positive part of the unit ball, then it's the same situation, the, the weak star closure of the, the set when you have maps from E to C. Uh, is the same as the corresponding set for maps from E to the bidual. So this is the, if, if, if you want, this is the positive version of the local reflexivity principle. And it implies exactly by the same reasoning that you know I've showed you previously for contractive, it implies that uh, you have positive contractive liftings in the finite dimensional case. So this brings me to a little, I think I've been a little slow, but this brings me to seemingly injective phenomenon algebras. I'm going to apply what I just showed you, this Vesterström result, and uh, <coughs> obtain a, a slightly surprising uh, uh, result on the free group uh, phenomenon algebra. Okay, so uh, I call a phenomenon algebra seemingly injective if the following holds. Uh, we have a, a, a factorization of the identity of M in the form V composed with U, where the maps U, V factor the identity through B of H, so our familiar B of H, but we have, to, we have important differences. So one important difference is U is an isometric map, so that's still an isometric embedding. It is unital positive, normal, okay? But that's all. And V is going to be, uh, let's say to start with, is going to be also just unital positive. Uh, v is not normal, but U is normal. This corresponds to you know, the, the, the embeddings of phenomenon algebras, okay? And it's analogous to that. Okay, so that's what we call seemingly injective. U and V are of norm one, unital positive. U is normal. So of course we have a projection there that we have, you know, like in the injective situation, the map U composed with V gives us a, a contractive 
positive unital projection onto the, the range of u, the range of u, which is u of m. And this u of m, because u is normal, this u of m is, is weak star closed. So it is a very analog, very much analogous to injectivity with the major difference that u is not a star homomorphism. So u m is not a Feynman subalgebra of B of H, and it has very little structure. I, I don't want to go into this, but there is a literature on uh, uh, JB star, JB W star algebra that, that actually also goes back to Efros, Efros Sturmer, and so on. And they can say something on such objects, but apparently I haven't been able to use the information that comes from that theory in connection with this, this notion. So let me, let me not go in that direction. Uh, uh, but let me say that for V, so for U, this is where we are. We cannot really improve this. U is normal unital positive isometric, but V, it's possible to, 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 to show that we can always get, in this situation, we can always get a V which is unital completely positive. So V we can improve, okay? It's not, it's not the problem. V is not the problem, but the, pro the, the, the difference is in U, the fact that U is not a phenomenon algebra embedding. Okay, so I'm sorry that I call this a uh, corollary because uh, uh, I think I changed something that was a theorem here, but that, that doesn't matter. That's a, a corollary of, Corollary of what? So, so what, what this uh, corollary says is that if you uh, assume that M is seemingly injective and you assume that you are on a separable Hilbert space, so H, this H is, is separable, then except for the obvious exceptions, which I will detail in a second, the phenomenon algebra is isomorphic as a Banach space to B of L2, the bounded operators on L2. And of course, this is isomorphic, not isometric, and isomorphic with a constant that uh, reflects a certain complication in the proof, but that's just because of certain iterated steps. So two to the 16 is what I found in a paper of Christensen and Sinclair in 1989, where they proved exactly the analogous fact for injective for Neumann algebras, and they, they showed it even with uh, completely isomorphic in their case. In, in the case which is here, I cannot get complete isomorphism. This is only for isomorphic. And the, the, the reason why this is similar to their technique is that, as I will explain in a second, the, the, the proof is just a consequence of Polchinski's famous decomposition method, very famous argument in Banach space theory and Polchinski's decomposition method says the following. If you want to show that two Banach spaces are isomorphic, like here we have M and B of L2. So suppose you have two Banach spaces, allow me to say X and Y, and you want to know that X and Y are isomorphic. So under some minor assumption, which I will leave out, if you know that X is complemented in Y. So X is isomorphic to a complemented subspace of Y. And in reverse, Y is isomorphic to a complemented subspace of X. So, okay. Then X and Y are isomorphic. So under certain you know, uh, assumptions, you, you have, uh, this is like Cantor-Bernstein, you know, but for isomorphic, isomorphy of, of Banach spaces, each one complemented in the other. That implies isomorphic. Of course, you need a restriction. But the restriction is that you know the spaces should be nice. And in the case of phenomenal algebras, we, we have it. So let me just say what is the obvious exceptional case quickly, because that's not so important for what I have to, to say. And I want to <clears throat> save, save time. So uh, the obvious case is, is the case which is written here star. It is when M is the direct sum of finitely many uh, phenomenon algebras, which are just very simply commutative tensor matrix algebra, finite dimensional matrix algebra. So I think that they call bounded finite type one, experts in phenomenon algebra classification theory call it like that. 
So it means you know, that M is essentially almost commutative. It's a, <clears throat> from the viewpoint of a Neumann algebra, it is very much a, a, a trivial case. And another coda is, is that uh, this is another footnote, if you like, is that this property star here, which is our essential, our exceptional case, is boils down to the same thing by a result of Simon Wasserman as saying that M is nuclear as a C star algebra. And uh, another result in that same paper of Wasserman says that the where he characterized these is that M is not like that. So M is not nuclear. M is not the, of this very, very simple form if and only if M contains a complemented copy of B of L2. Let's, let's say we are in the separable case, which probably doesn't matter for what I'm saying now, but let's say all this for the separable case. So in other words, uh, if, we, if we accept this obvious exception, you know, of uh, uh, these uh, algebras listed in this star here, except for this trivial case, M will always contain a complemented copy of B of L2. So now let me, let me go back, but you see, uh, if M is seemingly injective, we are saying here that an isometric copy of M is complemented in B of H because we have seen that this, uh, this map P is a projection from B of H to an isometric copy of M, okay? So M is complemented in B of H and then by Wasserman's result, you know, uh, uh, B of H, B of L2 is complemented in M. So this Polchinski principle applies and we conclude that it's, they're isomorphic. So now the surprise, the surprise is that the main example of this notion, which of course motivates all this, this is the reason for my interest, is that if you take a free group, then the phenomenon algebra of the free group is seemingly injective. So this is a little bit of a shock when you see this for the first time. And when you, like me, have learned that you know, injectivity is really the, the uh, phenomenal algebra of free groups. So to tell you the truth, when I first ran into this, I was sure that this was wrong. And I was very much hoping it was wrong because I could use it to show some, uh, some nice results. And then actually I, I, I saw that to my surprise, no, no, this is true. The, the, the free group phenomenal algebra is seemingly injective. And more precisely, more generally, actually, what I then I, I worked more on this notion, and uh, I could actually get a characterization of seemingly injective phenomenon algebras, which is here. So two equivalent forms, one being a variant of the other. So seemingly injective for a phenomenon algebra M is the same as asking that M is QWEP, so con-embeddable, this is synonymous, so this is the same thing, and it has the weak star positive metric approximation property, so this property that we discussed. And in fact, uh, the, we, we could use finite rank maps that factor positively through matrix algebras are as, as our approximation of the identity, so this is equivalent to saying that we have these finite dimensional matrix algebras MN alpha and maps U alpha V alpha that uh, uh, are maps on M that factor like this with U alpha normal, always we ask for normal, V alpha unital positive, both unital positive, both contractions, and such that uh, the composition tends to the identity weak star. So this is uh, just, just this property alone uh, is equivalent to seemingly injective. And you should, of course, relate it to uh, what I said earlier when I told you that the, the Choyefros-Kohn result was a characterization of injectivity by the weak star completely positive metric approximation property for M. So this is very much analogous to that. And some of the ideas actually uh, come up. But the main point in the case of free group, let me concentrate on the free group example because this is really the, the prototypical example. The main point for free group is a property proved by uh, De Canier and Hagerup. So uh, this is really a variant of Hagerup's you know, fundamental breakthrough uh, when he showed that uh, you know, the, the reduced sister algebra of the free group has uh, the metric approximation property. 
And uh, it says that the von Neumann algebra of the free group has the weak star unital positive metric approximation property. Okay, positive. So positive here is, is uh, the thing which is, uh, you know, a little bit surprising because uh, uh, completely positive is not true, right? So this is only with positive. So this is why somehow this was proved in the second paper because Hagerup left this out. It was not so natural, I think, in the first paper. So it appears in the paper with De Canier. And in fact, they show that uh, if you fix n, if you fix n and you replace positive by n positive, so you know, usual positive means uh, this for n equals to one. So you replace positive by n positive, then uh, again, your phenomenal algebra has the n positive metric approximation property in the weak star sense, but n has to be fixed because you cannot get completely positive. Okay. Let me see how I'm doing now. Uh, so Isan, do I have five minutes? Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, I, I, okay. So uh, let, me, let me try to, to, to go uh, over the proof by diagrams to explain, to explain this uh, perhaps slightly mysterious fact that the free group uh, factor, free group uh, for Neumann algebra is seemingly injective. So I, I just do it, you know, uh, on the diagram. So I, I, I hope that, that you are familiar maybe with what I didn't go into, which is that it, the free group embeds in an ultra product of matrix algebras. So that means that uh, in, in the case of this phenomenon algebra, it embeds in the quotient of bold face B, which is the direct sum of matrix algebras and quotiented by an ideal which is associated to uh, the ultra product, right? The sequences that tend to zero in the L2 norm of the trace, the normalized trace on MN. So I'm sorry, I'm here, I'm assuming maybe some familiarity with that uh, situation. But if you know what's a matrix model for the free group, then that's all you need to understand what's here. So we have this, as a, as a consequence, we have a quotient map onto this uh, ultra product. Our, 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 mate, our, our phenomenal algebra embeds in the ultra product, but since we are dealing with finite phenomenal algebras, here we have conditional expectation for free. So we have this projection capital P here, which is completely positive, contractive, and we have this quotient map here. So I, I, I can reproduce the, the diagram here. The, the, the diagram gives us that we have this map W from the, our nice space here, which is really like B of H, this direct sum of MN is like B of H. We have this W, which is uh, onto M, contractive surjection onto M. And then, <coughs> excuse me, the identity of, of M, the identity of M is approximable by uh, finite rank maps, uh, which are normal and positive. So I've, I've called them TIs, and we have these maps TIs that approximate the identity of M, but M is nicely represented by this quotient here. So uh, the, the map TI can be lifted because this, this W will be for the, uh, our purposes will, will, will be really like, uh, uh, like if it was a quotient star homomorphism, we can, we can play with it so that it boils down to the same thing. So we have this lifting UI, which is uh, positive. So I'm using Vesterstrom's result, a finite rank here, finite rank, a finite dimensional subspace, okay, EI in M, lifts with a positive map. So that gives me the UI, the positive UI by composing with the, the TI and EI is the range of TI. Okay, so now I can arrange all these liftings UI into one map. So I have a map U from M to the direct sum of the Bs. PI is just the ith coordinate in this direct sum here. U, U is just the direct sum of the UIs. PI just the ith coordinate, so that's very simple. 
And <clears throat> for the map V, I just introduce a, 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 a finer ultra filter, say U prime. And I define V as the, the weak star limit, of course, in the weak star sense of the compositions W, P, I, where P, I is the coordinate. <clears throat> and so finally, since T, I is a weak star approximation of the identity, this gives me a diagram, the diagram which is here, which is a factorization of the identity of M, because the limit of the T, I's is the identity. And so I've obtained <coughs> my U's, which are normal, uh, isometric. V is <coughs> a limit of contraction. So it's a contraction limit if positive. So it's a, you know, contraction, positive contractions. And everything is as announced in the definition of seemingly injective. The only minor difference is that I have the direct sum of these Bs. So I have an infinite direct sum of copies of MNs. But of course, this I can replace easily by B of H because this is, <coughs> injective and so it is it embeds in b of h with a projection of norm one so it makes no difference to have b of h or anything injective in uh, the definition of seemingly injective so that's that's a sketch of the the proof now a similar arguments will show that any qwep with weak star pmap is seemingly injective it just is much quicker to show you the the main idea on the on the diagrams and the main idea is really to just exploit this Vesterstrom uh, result. So then uh, for the converse, the, the fact that conversely seemingly injective implies the weak star approximation property. Well, first, it implies QWEP by Kirchberg's result. So if it's seemingly injective, it is QWEP. That's that's for sure. But to get the weak star <coughs> positive metric approximation property, I have to, to uh, make some observations on positive maps. So positive maps satisfy uh, on a, in, the, in the finite case. So I should say, I want to rush now. So, because I, I want to, to state the problem in the last slide. So if I have a, a finite von Neumann algebra and a, a contractive positive linear map, from B of H to M, so this is the map V, then I get, this is the non-trivial fact here, I, I will get this inequality, even though I don't know that it's completely positive, completely bounded, just from its being positive contraction, I, I get this. So this is, a, this is like a remark, it's a very simple remark, and it, it implies, however, that now <clears throat> you can get from this inequality by known arguments, hand banach type arguments, you get, <clears throat> you get a, a introducing multiplicity, you get what is written here in this line here. And now you're in business because you have some sort of representation of V uh, related to you know, a limit of, of maps with uh, here given by this form where H alpha is a finite rank, if we like, operator in the unit ball of uh, Hilbert Schmidt. And so th this expression on the right involves finite rank and then somehow using the Ephros lens tricks for the semi-discrete case, which I have uh, reviewed earlier, we get the, the weak star PMAP from this. But this is, this is a little bit technical to explain really in full details, but I, th I just want to review the, the idea, main idea. So of course, the natural question is, well, okay, so if the free group satisfies this, maybe everybody satisfies this. So are all QWEP for Neumann algebra is seemingly injective, maybe it's automatic. But the answer is no, for a very strange complicated reason, simply because Shankovsky improved in 1981, the Banach space result that uh, B of H as a Banach space fails the approximation property. So it follows that uh, clearly the bidual fails the weak star approximation property. And so the counterexample is the bidual of B of H. It is QWEP, no question, but it is not seemingly injective because it fails this approximation property. So the, I, I ask the, the obvious question for me is to, to try to find uh, examples of QWEP algebras failing this weak star positive metric approximation property without using you know, such a sledgehammer as uh, Shankovsky's theorem. And 
Of course, same question for groups. And then I get to the last, last slide here, uh, which is important for me because this is where I have my problem. So the problem where I got stuck is this. I want to consider now a more general notion that seemingly injective. So this is called contractively seemingly injective, but it's, it's more general. Maybe my terminology is not good, but contractively emphasizes that I, I drop positivity on U and V. I just require U and V contractive, okay? And I look at the same thing. So I just drop positivity. That's all I drop. U should be normal and U and V are contraction. Does this imply the weak star metric approximation property? I don't know. And in fact, I don't have any counterexample to this property. Is it true that any, <coughs> excuse me, any phenomenal algebra, I don't have any counterexample. Is it true that any phenomenal algebra, which is QWEP, so this you need, you need QWEP. If it is QWEP, it is, is it automatically like this? Does it satisfy this? And the reason why I would like a counterexample very much, could be wrong, but I would like a counterexample because if I have a counterexample, then I will have a negative solution to the contractive lifting problems that I stated you know, up front. The reason is that if a phenomenon algebra is QWEP, so that's my theorem here, if M is QWEP, and if all separable subspaces have the contractive lifting property, as I, as I you know, stated earlier, then M is automatically contractively seemingly injective. Using the same kind of proof that I used for the free group, one gets to this. And so if I have a counterexample, I will get a counterexample automatically to the contractive lifting property. Okay, this is enough. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Anyone has any questions? Now you can admit yourself and ask. Yeah, Gilles, thanks. Uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, one question is that, uh, so you're saying that we don't know any example of a group for which the weak star uh, positive approximation doesn't work? I mean, it doesn't have? Um, well, I, I certainly don't know. Yes, yes, I don't know. Yes, I don't know. That would be right. That would be a, 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 a yeah. This is this is probably you know this is accessible, but definitely I don't know. This would be you know better than this sledgehammer of uh, using uh, using using you know Shankovsky's result for that. So. Uh, Yes, this is what I'm asking. Yes, yes. I think it's, uh, that is probably accessible, but I don't know. Yes, the, the, the thing which really infuriates me is this last slide. This is why I wanted to get to it. This is because, you know, asking, does there exist, a, well, I mean, it's like, the Konkiepberg problem, but does there yeah. exist a, a von Neumann algebra which does not satisfy yeah. this? And, and, and this looks like a quite, still quite a strong property. Yeah. And, and think, uh, really the analogy uh, should have some connection to approximation property. So it should be, you know, not always true, but I can't, can't rule it out. And uh, just that because of the way the free product, sorry, the free group is. So if we take injectives and make a free product, then we always get uh, this property, uh, weak star PMP. Uh, good question, but I don't, I really know very little on uh, Good question. No, I, I definitely don't know because you see that would mean that you would have to understand how positive unital positive maps behave under free products. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's that you see just unital. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, you know, I, 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 yeah, yeah. You see, this is this is. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. No, I don't know. 
<clears throat> the, the only thing, you know, more general than uh, what De Canier Hageroup have in their paper is, I, uh, I, I did state it here, is there's a paper by Jolissin and Valette oh. who uh, extended this result, but with the same ideas really, you know, to property RD yeah. uh, okay. with respect to, you know, a good, good length function. But this is, this is well known that this is just an extension of the Hageroup yeah. ideas. Yeah, 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 that's... Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Sure, welcome. Professor Singh, you had uh, some question. You can ask. Uh... Yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, you know, the, uh, as we have non-amenability, non-amenable group for normal algebras. Now, a non-amenable group need not contain a free group, but does a phenomenon algebra contain a seemingly injective algebra? Um, uh, it was open till now, you know, but it has been proved now that every non-amenable group need not contain a free group. But can we ask the similar question for the phenomenon algebras? So uh, you're right. Uh, this is so. This is open for the von Neumann algebra. So if you take a non-injective von Neumann algebra, yes. some people some people believe that it will contain. For instance, Sorin Popa, I think, believes that it's possible. Well, you know, it's very, it's kind of very how to say audacious, uh, but very bold. But uh, it might be true that, that it always contains, a, so you would have a positive uh, solution in, in the context of von Neumann algebra, that it contains a von Neumann algebra isomorphic to, um, to the free group von Neumann algebra. Yes, this is conceivable. And in fact, there is a, you know, a few years ago, there was a, a big breakthrough done by uh, Russell Lyons and Damien Gaborio, who proved in the, in the setting of uh, measure preserving, you know, transformations and uh, certain, you know, certain special class of phenomenal algebras, it, it turned out to be true. It's a, it's a rather surprising, it was a very surprising result. So, so that, that's, that's in doubt. What you're asking is, is, is in doubt. It's not, I don't think there is a consensus that the answer will be no. Maybe probably it is no because the group case is no, but um, not clear. Now the connection you, with seemingly you. with seemingly injective, I, I, it's it's hard to make a connection. I I don't think it really has a yeah connection uh, because for seemingly injective, really the the questions are more you know the tough questions are more like uh, like this one in this screen here that uh, is it. Is it really special or, or is it something that, you know, anything that satisfies the con embedding must satisfy this? You know, this is the, the question. Must, must it satisfy this with the UV contractive? For me, that's, that's the, has been the, the big headache <laughs> because yeah. this is what I was after, really. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, an alternative would be given M1 contained in M2, does there exist N between M M? And M2, which is seemingly injective, interspersing, interspersing theorem. As, uh, it is there for Banach spaces. Sims and Yost have it. And uh, Monkey, which also had it, you know, interspersing subspaces. Anyway, thank you. And, uh, you know, uh, but there are many generalizations by algebraic, purely algebraic, like Jan and Surjit Singh have almost injective, relative injective, and many other things. So uh, will there be relationship between any of the alge purely algebraic notions or not? Because there are various generalizations. Purely algebraic, purely algebraic, no, I, 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 uh, I mean, we don't ask for continuity or CP or anything, just in algebraic sense, you know, um, uh, we take injectivity. And there are se uh, several generalizations. So where will this fit in? I would like to know. Uh, and uh, another thing that I would ask is, uh, will it be enough uh, to have V as a generalized inverse of U? I mean, where will we lose if we take V as a generalized inverse of U? U V U equal to U instead of what you put. Uh, 
you v u equals to u uh, I mean uh, we just ask for u v u equal to u uh, then v is called a generalized inverse of u but it is the case here u v u is equal to u uh, u v oh sorry u v u u v u wait a minute u v u uh, I'm confused. Um, v U is the identity, so yes, U, V U, uh, uh, so V U is that, yes, yeah. yes. Um, uh, uh, so if a V U is identity, then U V U is U, but supposing we only ask for existence of V. Say that U V U is U. Where will we lose? That is what I I am wondering. Uh, well, of of course you you you. So you mean bounded or or? Um... Uh, oh well, I mean bounded is difficult, but uh, I'm just uh, thinking of this condition. You know, instead of V U equal to identity, because mm -hmm. for generalized inverse, V U and U V are both projections anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure I can make sense of anything in, in that direction. Oh, fine, fine. I just wondered, yeah. so I thought I'll ask. And uh, I but, heard uh, a seminar by a young PhD student from Lancaster, Max Arnott, and he was asking the question for Banach spaces, take a subspace F. Will there be a map T such that this F is kernel of T? So. Uh, the same question for ideals and things like that, rather than just going to quotient map, we just ask for any map. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, this is being run by Jared White and others under Gelfand uh, operator algebras and Banach algebra series. Okay, okay, I will check. Okay, I, I will check about this. The fellow's name is Arnold, right? Arnold, so, Max Arnold. He's at Lancaster and he has put up the paper on archive. Yes, it is really. purely Banach space setting. And I suggested to him to go to oh. Banach algebra setting and he's happy over that. Okay, I can look. Okay. Okay, I can look. The, your, your question actually uh, prompted me to also recall a problem, another problem you know, of the hybrid type between Banach space and operator algebra that I like very much, which is this Tomiyama theorem tells you that if you have a phenomenon algebra sitting in B of H, realized as a phenomenon subalgebra of B of H, if you, Tomiyama says, if you have a contractive projection, then it's injective. That's, you know, the definition is completely. Okay, positive. thank you. Thank you, but, thank you, but, thank you. But, but what I wanted to recall is that if you just assume that you have a bounded linear projection from B of H to M, so just a bounded linear projection, it is still open whether this implies injective. See, we, okay. we, we, we proved, and this was <coughs> independently Christensen Sinclair and so on, that with completely bounded projection, it's okay, <laughs> it's injective, but with bounded, it's, it's not. So, uh, so there, there, there we, we are, and this is perhaps related to what's going on here in this question in this last screen that you know you have. Uh, okay, you have so thank you. So Gilles, thank the paper of completely bounded. So this this was like uh, Hagerup and your paper, right? Um, well, in B of H, I think it was me and uh, and Christian Sinclair did it in me independently. <laughs> It was early 90s or something, I recall vaguely. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I would ask you to pen it down so that it will help the young students. Okay, please, uh, please send it to me so that I can send it to him. Okay. Uh, you're talking to me? Uh, you, you please send the question related to Tomiyama to oh, me okay, so okay. that I can send it to the young student, Arnott. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you very much. Wonderful talk. I learned a lot. <laughs> You're welcome. So maybe uh, we, uh, any other questions or? Ajin, back in your talk, 
you said something about the concentrating problem and the guys that solved it in the negative. And you also said that something about which is not known. Can you, I mean, I just did not get it. Concentrating is false, right? I mean, uh, given, yes. given those guys. Yes, yes, but but they 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 prove it, you know, going through uh, the equivalence with Tirelson. So uh, <coughs> they do not get they do not get the phenomenon algebra of a group, not conembeddable. They just get a, they just get that there is a phenomenon yeah. algebra. Yeah. Oh, I see. So, you know, for groups, there is this conjecture whether every group is sophic, which is still open as far as I know, which is closely connected. And, and this is why group theorists got excited by, by this sort of theory, because they thought they could, they could actually solve, solve it. But uh, anyway, this is, this is nothing new in, in, in the group, in the group for Neumann algebra case. In some sense, that was, you know, the beginning of the story because what Kohn, you know, Kohn observed was really the free group. So in some sense, it's the, <laughs> the group case is the, very much central to, to that question. So, uh... So let's thank uh, Professor Pizier again. Thanks for the well, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for and the invitation. It's all a pleasure. Right? Thanks to all participants. So we'll uh, take a short break from our seminars and we'll meet next year on January 13th with our next talk.